My foster parents kicked me out on my 18th birthday without reason. They came crawling back years later with a disturbing explanation as to why they did it. On the morning of my 18th birthday, I was aggressively awoken by my foster dad, and before my eyes were even fully open, he started yelling at me to get the F out of the house. He literally kicked me out of bed, and as I left the room, I was met with my foster mother staring daggers at me. She repeated what he said, and since I had nowhere to go, I pleaded with them to let me stay. In a moment of anger, I asked if they were kicking me out because I was black, and they were white. My foster dad replied, that's not it, but if that's what you really think then maybe our friends were right about you. You know, we never loved you and never saw you as our own, we don't want anything to do with you, so get out. I left the house then and there, and I ended up at a park bench, just sitting there trying to figure out what to do next. I had a few bucks in my pocket and a backpack with some clothes, but no real plan. The sun was starting to rise when I finally decided to call my best friend, Tyler. Tyler answered on the second ring, he asked why I called him because it was 7 in the morning, his voice was groggy. I told him flat out that they had kicked me out, Tyler was still out of it. He asked who and I told him my foster parents. I told him exactly what they said. There was a long pause on the other end. Then Tyler said, meet me at the diner in 20. We'll figure this out. His voice was more alert now. I dragged myself to the diner. Tyler was already there, waiting in our usual booth. As soon as he saw me, he stood up and gave me a hug. Man, I'm so sorry. That's messed up. He told me as he embraced me. We ordered some breakfast, and as we ate, I told him everything. The sly comments they would make when I was a kid, and how they would act whenever company came over. Tyler listened. One day when I was playing with my cousins, one of the cousins asked me why I looked different from the rest of them. The adults didn't say much but be nice, but they still taunted me. When we were teenagers the cousins hung out together all the time, but they never invited me with them. When I asked them why they didn't invite me, they would tell me it was because they didn't know that I wanted to come or make up another excuse. They had a pretty close friend group. I wouldn't have paid much mind to it if we didn't go to the same school, but we did. It hurt seeing them all eat lunch together without me and my parents never stepped in and said anything to them about all the years they excluded me. Now they were planning to go to the same college together and I thought my parents would put me through that college as well, but here we are. After I finished, he sighed heavily. Tyler told me that it sounded like the reason I went through all this was because I was black and lived with a white family. He said that since we were in the South that they probably faced a lot of backlash for taking me in. He said that his family was more laid back about that kind of thing and didn't care what color I was, hence why they allowed us to be friends. But he said his parents' friends would ask why they would allow him to hang out with me knowing that I could be a bad influence on him. I had never thought about it that way, but it made a twisted sort of sense. I decided to confront my family to seek the truth. I called them, but they didn't answer. I left messages, but they never called back. I decided to come back home and try to speak with them. I saw dad's car in the driveway and knocked on the door. I saw him peek through the blinds and ignore my knocks. I called the house phone again, and he came to the door and told me that I needed to leave. The neighbors were looking through their windows watching us talk. I asked him why had he not protected me all those years, and why they decided to kick me out on my birthday. He said again that I needed to leave and threatened to call the police. I left just as quickly as I came. I couldn't believe he threatened to call the police on me after taking me in when I was three and raising me until today. They turned me away, and I felt like the little boy that no one wanted to play with all over again. I made the difficult decision to leave my hometown. I moved to a new city a bit further north. The first few months were incredibly tough. I stayed in a shelter for a while, saving up every penny I earned from a bunch of dead-end jobs. Eventually, I managed to rent a small, run-down apartment. It wasn't much, but it was mine. I enrolled in night classes at a community college and worked during the day. I was exhausted all the time, but I was determined to make something of myself. Years passed. I finished my associate degree and landed a decent job as an administrative assistant at a marketing firm. It wasn't glamorous, but it was stable, and I was good at it. I even got a few promotions along the way. Then I met Jasmine. She was a new hire at the firm, and we hit it off immediately. Jasmine was smart, funny, and incredibly kind. She had this way of making everyone around her feel special. We started dating, and before long, we were inseparable. A few years later, I planned a perfect night for her and I. I had been planning this evening for months, saving up every spare penny to make it unforgettable. Jasmine deserved the best, and I was determined to give it to her. We arrived at the rooftop restaurant just as the sun was setting. The sky was beautiful. It was pink and gold as the sunset. Jasmine's eyes showed her excitement as we were shown to our private table, tucked away in a corner with a breathtaking view of the skyline. She said she couldn't believe that I did all of this. She thanked me over and over. I told her that she only deserved the best, and that was what I wanted to give her. As we ate our meal, we reminisced funny and sentimental times in our relationship. I couldn't help but think about how much she had changed my life. Jasmine Jasmine had been my rock. She made me believe in love and trust again. After dessert, the waiter poured us a final glass of champagne.
pain. This was it. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the small velvet box. My heart pounded as I got down on one knee. I told Jasmine that she had been my light in the darkest of times and my partner in every joy and challenge. I told her how special she was and how I couldn't imagine my life without her. I asked her to marry me. Jasmine's eyes filled with tears and she covered her mouth with her hands. For a moment, she was silent and I felt my heart stop. Then, she nodded vigorously. Her smile broke through the tears. I slipped the ring onto her finger and we both stood up and held each other in a tight embrace. The restaurant patrons around us erupted in applause, but in that moment, it felt like we were the only two people in the world. For the first time in my life, I felt truly happy, but the pain of my past never really left me. I tried to forget about my foster family and what they did to me, but it was always there, lurking in the back of my mind. One day, out of the blue, I got a message from my foster parents. They wanted to reconnect again and explain why they had kicked me out. At first, I was furious. How could they expect me to listen after all the pain they caused? But Jasmine encouraged me to hear them out. Reluctantly, I agreed to meet them. The first time seeing them again was tense. My foster father spoke first. He sounded regretful and said he owed me an explanation. He said when I turned 18, they found out that thousands of dollars of their emergency cash had gone missing. They hid it in a small cabinet in a cookie jar that no one went in but them and their closest family friend convinced them that I was the one who stole it. I was taken aback. I asked them if they thought that I stole their money why they didn't just ask me. My foster mother's eyes became filled with tears. She said that they were so hurt and angry that they didn't know how to confront me and added that they didn't want to confront me at all. They figured that I would own up to it and that there was no point in asking. I felt a surge of anger and betrayal. They had kicked me out based on an accusation without even giving me a chance to defend myself. I did my own digging that night. I started by combing through the profiles of my foster family and their circle of friends, looking for any clues. I scrolled endlessly through posts, pictures and comments, hoping something would jump out at me. One night, as I was deep into my investigation, I came across a post from Karen, the close family friend that was very vocal about me stealing from my foster parents. Her profile was filled with pictures of her recent activities, but one post from around the time I was kicked out caught my eye. It was a photo of a brand new car, a sleek, red convertible. The caption read, Finally got my dream car. Hard work pays off. Something about the timing felt off. I dug deeper, scrolling through the comments, and looking for any clues about how she managed to afford it. Then I found it. A comment from one of her friends read, Congrats Karen, did you win the lottery or something? Karen's reply was casual, almost dismissive. Nope, just good financial planning and some help from an old friend. I needed to know more. I called Tyler and told him about the post. We made a plan. Tyler would go to the dealership, pretending to be a relative, and try to get some information about the payment for Karen's car. The next day, Tyler called me and said he went to the dealership and talked to a salesman. He told him I was Karen's cousin and that he wanted to surprise her with some custom accessories for her new car. He asked about the payment details, and guess what? He told me she put down a huge cash payment, the exact same amount as my foster family's missing emergency funds. My heart pounded in my chest. This was it. I had the proof I needed. Karen had taken the money and used it to buy her car, all while letting my foster parents believe I was the thief. I decided to confront Karen directly. I went to their house. When I told them all that I knew she broke down, confessing everything, she said she was in a bad place financially and felt like this was her way to enjoying her life. She said she panicked about how sorry she was. Then she talked about how she didn't mean for it to get this far. I recorded our conversation on the phone stored in my pocket. After I got what I needed, I went back to my foster parents. They were deeply apologetic. They said they were so sorry and that we were wrong and should have trusted me. I told them that I appreciated their apology, but the lack of trust they had in me mixed with the treatment I received growing up was too much baggage to have a relationship after that. They threw me out without any real evidence, and I couldn't just forget that. As my wedding day approached, I made a difficult decision. I chose not to invite them. I knew that inviting them would bring on more pain on me and Jasmine's special day. They were hurt when they found out the news, but they respected my choice. On my wedding day, I was surrounded by friends and loved ones. I felt a sense of peace I had never known before. I had built a new life, one filled with love and happiness, and I was determined to protect it. The journey had been long and painful, but I had finally found my way. With Jasmine by my side, I looked toward the future. After the wedding, life continued to improve. Jasmine and I bought a house, and we talked about starting a family of our own. The pain from my past didn't vanish overnight, but it became easier to manage with time and the support of my new family. I kept working hard at my job, and eventually, I got promoted to a management position. It was a big step for me, and it felt like all my hard work was finally paying off. Jasmine was always there, cheering me on, and I knew I couldn't have done it without her. Every now and then, I'd get a message from my foster parents, usually around the holidays. They kept apologizing and asking for another chance. It was hard to know what to do. Part of me wanted to forgive them, to rebuild some kind of relationship,
relationship, but another part of me was still so hurt and angry. One night, Jasmine and I were talking about it, and she said something that really stuck with me. Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to let them back into your life. It just means you're choosing to let go of the anger for your own peace. I thought about that a lot. I realized I was holding on to my anger, but it was also weighing me down. So, I decided to forgive them in my heart, even if I wasn't ready to let them back in. A few months later, I wrote them a letter. I told them I appreciated their apologies, and that I forgave them for what they did. I also explained that I wasn't ready to have a relationship with them, but I wished them well. It felt like a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Life went on, and things got better and better. Jasmine and I had our first child, a beautiful baby girl we named Lily. Holding her for the first time, I felt a kind of love I'd never experienced before. I promised myself I would always be there for her, no matter what.